seats. We will go along. That was excellent. Okay, oh, thank I, I hope I hope I didn't tease you too oh, hard. Heard every, no, no, I heard every word perfect. Okay. Uh, really. Okay. I'll send you At this one. point I should be introducing Val Green. But he is somewhat lost in this beautiful country. And if you know Val Green, he's the one that uh, followed the Indian trails and so forth and identified uh, where Lawson went. And there's now a book out, and I can't tell you who the author was on the cover. But the name of the book is A Beautiful Country, and I was going to talk about uh, that and about the uh, Indians that were in Marion when he gets here, I hope. In the meantime, Rick has stepped forward to talk about one of my favorite subjects involving Marion, the Bridges Campaign. And, uh, I think he's going to tell you how Mary has turned from being an out and out gorilla to being more of a regular uh, soldier at the end of the couple of weeks. Marion has not been idle. 
just think about this. From the, the 23rd of January to 15th February, that short period of time, he's involved in seven different actions. Okay, one of the things about uh, Marion, a word that you can use about him and his brigade, effective. These guys are out making things happen, okay? As a matter of fact, Rawdon is out trying to pin him down. Rawdon goes out with his troops, and they're pursuing uh, 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 Marion, and then word comes along that Thomas Sumter has retaken the field. From Blackstock's plantation, Sumter has received a severe wound, has taken him about four months to be able to recover enough to take the field again. Now, Rawdon writes a letter, and in that letter he says that was after Marion gave up the pursuit, Marion has escaped across Cape Horse Swamp, and I am after Thomas Sumter. Okay, why was he after Sumter, and why did he fear Sumter so much? Because Sumter could raise a thousand men. Sumter could do a lot of damage. Therefore, he was the priority target, if you will. Sumter calls out his men. Now, here's the problem. That man that is able to raise a thousand troops sends out the word and about 280 show up. Okay, well why in the world such a reduced outcome when he calls for his troops? Well, one of the reasons that for that reduced outcome is that all those folks that went up into North Carolina, all the, all the militia folks are thinking, hey, we can breathe a sigh of relief right now. Hey, we can plow our fields, we can plant our crops, we can take care of our families, and then when the main British Army comes back down, we'll worry about it again. Hey, Francis Marion was having the same problem. He was sending out word to try to bring his guys in, and they're kind of thinking the same thing. So, Sumter, though he only has 280 men, he is going to execute what becomes known as his rounds campaign. So, his first stop is to come down here to Fort Granby, over in uh, West Columbia, South Carolina now. So he gets over to Fort Granby and he's going to do a siege. He gets there about the 19th of uh, uh, February and he starts his siege. Rawdon has found out what's going on. He sends uh, Colonel Wellbore Doyle and his uh, battalion, and they go after Sumter. And when they go after Sumter, they, uh, Sumter finds out that they're coming. So his siege only lasts a matter of two days. He finds out that Doyle is coming, and Doyle is smart. And they're using something that, uh, that Rawdon will try a little later on. They're going to try a little bit of a hammer and anvil type thing, because Doyle goes in and leaves a unit at Friday's Ferry, the same ferry that Sumter had crossed, and takes the rest of his unit over to, uh, to Fort Grandy. The intent there is that he thinks that Sumter will then fall back, try to cross the same way he came. If he does that, you catch him between two forces, and it works pretty good for the British, but not so much for Sumter. But it doesn't work that way. Sumter fools him. How does Sumter fool him? He doesn't go back to Friday's Ferry. He goes up and pursue and comes over to Belleville, Belleville Plantation. Belleville Plantation is kind of a reinforced supply center. Uh, they've got it fortified. You can get supplies there. Sumter goes over, tries a quick siege there. First day he tries assault, he's unsuccessful. That night, he pulls most of his force back and he goes over to Manigo's plantation, near Manigo's <coughs> ferry, about two miles away or so. There at Manigo's, a supply column comes through. Okay, that supply column comes in, uh, has about, I think it's 20 wagons, 50 troops, and they capture them all. But there's a little problem also that Sumter creates for himself, is that as one of his units comes up and they've already captured these guys, Lacey's men said, oh, by the way, we have not discharged our own muskets. They fire into the prisoners and kill seven of them. Okay, Francis Marion will hear about that again. So, after that, at Manigo's Ferry, Reinforcements come up. Rawdon sends uh, uh, Major McElroth with the 64th. They go up, and even though he outnumbers Sumter at the time, 
he can't take advantage of it because as soon as McElroy sees Sumter form up, he falls back, drops back about four miles. Well, I'll tell you, Sumter realizes he can't maintain that position because you have other troops that may be coming down from Fort Granby to reinforce, so he has got to get out of Dodge. Oh, excuse me, let me really talk to you about those supplies. When they captured the supplies with the 20 wagons, there was ammunition, weapons, and uniforms for about three regiments worth of troops. Three regiments back then would be about 1,500 troops. Okay, so they put them on boats and they're sending them down the Santee River and Sumter and his folks are going to rendezvous with those boats later on. That is an unbelievably good haul. However, they hire a river boat or a river pilot that's going to take them down the Santee. The guy's name is Bob Livingston. I do not know if he's any relation to our current adjutant general or not, but Bob Livingston takes them under the guns of Fort Watson, and all of a sudden the Patriots realize we're in a bad fix. They have to abandon those supplies. So the British capture them right back. Okay, so the next thing that happens, Sumter has to make a decision. Either he is going to be able to go back the way he came, which means he will probably have to go up all the way around 96 to get back to where he wants to go, or he can come down this way, but Santee River is in a kind of a flood stage at that point. It's pretty big. He does decide to come down here around Nelson's Ferry. Actually, it's the flood uh, plantation he goes to. He gets there, and when he gets the flood plantation, he realizes, how am I, you know, I have no way to get across. So they look up and down the bank, and they find one cypress canoe. With that one cypress canoe over a period of several days, the canoe can hold one guy to paddle and three guys in it. They let their horses swim with them and they're able to get across the river. They finally get everybody across the river and when they do, he decides he's going to attack Fort Watson. Now, our swamp fox is very cautious. He's a well thought out, well planned commander. He will send his scouts out. He will know what he's going up against. Sumner is somewhat impetuous. He decides he's going to do for Fort Watson, and with Fort Watson, he is not really doing a reconnaissance. He goes right in, not realizing that Colonel Watson has about his full force there. There is a sharp engagement, and that sharp engagement, 18 killed, 38 captured for Sumner's guys. So if you started off with 280, hey, that is not good uh, tidings for you. So what happens? Sumter uh, pulls off and he decides I've got to do something else. And that something else turns to coming up in this direction where he polices up his wife, Mary, and his son, Thomas. They've been staying at a plantation. Now, something about uh, uh, Mary Sumter. Mary Sumter, had a, a paralytic left side. Her left arm was withered. She didn't walk very well. To be able to travel, they didn't have a wagon or whatever, so they had to put her on the back of a horse. They strapped a mattress over the horse, and one of her servants held on to her. I understand that the poor lady fell off the horse several times during this trip, so that was not good. And that leads us up to, they go up to Radcliffe's Bridge, and on the 6th of March, they have the engagement with Fraser's unit, and then Sumter and his family are out of the state. Okay. During this time, Sumter had been trying to get Francis Marion to join up with him, to have a coordinated type operation. Well, several things going on. First of all, when you receive messages and you're trying to rally your troops, remember, Francis Marion never had that many troops at any one given time. And you're now trying to convince people, hey, we're going to leave your homes, leave your families, and go kind of out of our area of operations to be able to help Thomas Sumner. People didn't turn out. Just like Sumner only got 280, Francis Marion is getting very few people that are coming to the call. Okay? So, 26th of February, Marion writes, hey, the enemy is too strong for me to move. 
because his scouts were out. He knew where the enemy was. Remember, they were looking for him. That's a big territory, and you can hide, but if you get too many patrols out, you're going to run into one, and when you run into a patrol, pretty soon they start to be able to collect together, and you lose the numbers at that point. Okay? Uh, Mary did try to get the summer. And we'll kind of look at the next slide here real quick because it was like two ships passing in the night. Because, uh, believe it or not, they came extremely close to each other but just passed right by. Okay? Well, we, sorry about that. 27th of February, up, that's where Marion and his group is up here. If you read Marion's orderly book, and you look at where they have each of the entries. He never stays more than a day, generally, at any given location. This is a rare exception here. They stayed for two or three days right in that location. However, in the total amount of time that Sumter says that Marion didn't try to uh, come to him, Marion and his men marched 120 miles. They marched 120 miles, they came down to here. They're here on March the 1st. And then they come up, okay? Well, March the 2nd, down here is where Sumter is. Marion is here on March the 2nd. March the 3rd, there's where Sumter is. They march right past each other, okay? They just weren't able to coordinate and get themselves together, okay? So, at this point, Sumter has left the state. Marion's the only show in town, okay? These are the things that Francis Marion and his brigade have been doing, okay? When we talk about an insurgency, an insurgency is more than just military operations. Insurgencies are about the people. You're able to recruit your support from those people. You're able to get all the supplies. Think about this, Francis Marion and his men survived and fought for over a year with next to no support coming from the Continental Government, from the, uh, I mean, uh, Green was asking Marion for supplies. Okay, so everything had to come from the people. So, the way you do a counterinsurgency is you go into the region where the enemy is most active and you're able to keep the people from being able to support the insurgent force, the partisan force that Marion had, you're making those people have to stay at home rather than taking up muskets and rifles and joining Francis Marion. So that's all a part of a counterinsurgency campaign and plan. So, and that effective word I talked about, what Robert Gray says down here, Marion has got a stranglehold on the eastern part of South Carolina. Rawls' plan, he knows that Marion's a problem. I have taken measures which I hope will prevent Marion from troubling us much more. In his letters to uh, Cornwallis, Rawls is laying out and he's got a plan. Now, there's no, uh, there is no smoking gun here where he says, this is what I'm going to do. So, in a lot of things with the campaign that we're talking about, the Bridges campaign, some of the dates and that sort of thing, uh, you have to play Colombo to figure things out. Uh, now, with this group, I think I can say, play Colombo and you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, so, on the 24th of March, the last part that confirms it, that Watson and Doyle with separate court, court are pursuing what married. Okay, so, what we know here is that there was a plan by Rawdon to directly take on Mary. <coughs> Here's one of the fun parts about doing this thing. As you look at Gibbs' documentary history of the Revolutionary War, we found this letter over here. And this letter was from uh, Rawdon to Watson. And that letter, he says essentially, <coughs> hey, Marion, uh, or correction, uh, Sumter has got his family, has left the area, don't think he'll be back. Marion can't call too many people out. I don't think he's going to have very many more people uh, to join him. If your intelligence is the same as mine, then 
and he goes into a numeric cipher down here. So when you run into something like this, what's the first thing you do? Hey, you call Charles Baxter. <laughs> so I called Charles and I said, and actually we were having lunch and we were talking about this letter and I'm like, you know, the, there's got to be a cipher. So he provided me all the, uh, the, the cipher guy that's with the, uh, the Southern Campaign, the American Re Revolution or whatever, got that information and I could determine what the first letter was. And the first letter was going to be A, 16 equals A. But trying to break the code the rest of the way just wasn't happening. So as I was lamenting the fact that this letter that was owed some 239 years old that, uh, you know, wasn't able to get the rest of the information, because personally I wanted it to be that smoking gun. I wanted it to be something where it was going to say, you know what, Doyle is going to come into Stowe's Island. Watson, I want you to push Marion into him. That's what I was hoping for. Okay? What happens is, I, I'm here to tell you, I don't know who Charles Baxley does not know. <laughs> because uh, he says, well, you know, we can only get more information. And I said, wait a minute. I bet Ian Saberton, the guy who was the editor for the Cornwall Hollis papers, he's probably dealt with these codes numerous times. And he says, yeah, okay, well, I can send him an email. So I sent Charles an email. He sends it to Ian Saberton. Ian Saberton sends it back. And he says, hey, that's the Camden code. And you know what? After 239 years, may have been 238, we broke the code. And what he said was, you will please to send Fanning's regiment here, and Smalls may return to Monk's Corner. Well, what the heck does that mean, and how does that help me looking at the Bridges campaign? What that tells me, as a, a military guy, is that number one, Rawdon was confident that the numbers that Marion had, that Watson's force was sufficient to handle it. The other thing it tells me is that when you send Fanning's regiment to Camden, that gives you strength and numbers that you can release Doyle to go to Snow's Island as a second part of the campaign. And last but not least, Smalls going over to Monk's Corner, essentially a guard force that was going in where the supplies and things were at Monk's Corner. Okay, so this was from a captured letter. I think that at least one of those letters got through because you had to send multiple folks out. I believe Lord Rawdon said at one time that he thought he had to put 500 men to guard one messenger just to get something between Camden and Charleston. Well, that was how tight the cordon was that Marion's men had set up. Hey, messengers couldn't get through. You couldn't get a messenger to take, uh, to take anything out for the most part. Why? Because too many folks were getting away late. So this is what Watson's plan, at least what we think it was. The major part of the plan was having, uh, having Watson come into the uh, Williamsburg district, disrupt the, uh, the district in here, being able to deprive Marion of men and support, and then Doyle would come into Snow's Island. If it worked perfectly, and I will hear to tell you, as Charles has said before, hey, and you know what, two cell phones would have accomplished back then, okay? <laughs> but if it worked perfectly, you would have Doyle come in here, tear up Snow's Island, and set a blocking position or an anvil, and the hammer would have driven Marion right back on. I think that was Rawdon's plan. Did it work? Well, let's talk about that. Okay, so Watson. Watson is a 33-year-old guy, and he is the commander of the Provincial Light Infantry. He would have been with uh, Clinton's personal guard when Clinton came to Charleston in 1780, and now he has a unit that was formed specifically for him. Light infantry works great against folks like Marion's guys. Why? Because you got light infantry on light infantry. There's a difference. The difference being that Marion's men are mounted. You've got speed, you've got agility, you've got the ability to outmaneuver, and oh, by the way, Guerrilla tactics are great. You fight as dismounted infantry, 
and when it's time to go, you're moving with speed. Provincial Light Infantry, they're all foot soldiers. Hey, they're not going to catch up with those mounted guys after a quick firefight. Okay? So, in 17, December 1780, the uh, Provincial Light Infantry comes into Charleston along with General Leslie's Corps, and when he comes in, he is given the command over around Nelson's Ferry. And he's not happy about it. As a matter of fact, Lord Balfour has to talk to him, and Lord Balfour being the Commandant in Charleston, and said, hey, an independent command is good. An independent command is very good, as a matter of fact. Because if you got up with the regular army, they're just going to use you for uh, piddly type things. So enjoy what you got. Well, Watson had to be convinced of this, but he goes over and he knows that he's got to have a, a, a reinforced area there to be able to work around the area that is the supply line between Charleston and Camden. So the road goes through, crosses Nelson's Ferry, goes on up into Camden. So he finds a, a, a Santee Indian mound over a thousand years old and he builds a fort on top of it and appropriately names it Fort Watson. Okay, so he does Fort Watson they give him some South Carolina Rangers. These guys are okay. They're mounted troops, but a lot of people speak disparagingly of them. And he also has a three-pound cannon called a grasshopper. So he got, he's got some artillery support, so a pretty strong fortification for the time. Okay, so once he is in position, his next mission is he is going to go out and he is going to look for Francis Mary. He's going to do aggressive type patrolling, and he is going to try to latch on to this guy and if things work out, then he will be able to push him back into Williamsburg District. Oh, and uh, he gets uh, reinforced. Rollin also gives him a second three-pounder, so now he has two cannon, and also gives him an attachment to the 64th Regiment. Uh, let me tell you about the 64th Regiment. These are old guys. As a matter of fact, Watson wrote a letter to uh, Clinton some years later, and in it in he describes the 64th as the gray hairs. <laughs> okay? And not that any of us could identify with that. Uh, but anyways, so uh, these guys are probably late 30s, 40s, but they are, for their ages, pretty fit troops. And they're veteran troops. So they help him out a lot. Okay? So these are the uh, troops that Watson has at his command totals about 500 troops. Here's Marion's command. Again, most of these folks are mounted. You've got a little bit of every type of weapon you can imagine out there. You've got some captured British brown vessels. You've got rifles you brought from home. You've got fouling pieces. Hey, from what I understand, goose shot was a very, very good uh, uh, ammunition of choice to fire against these guys. Those, uh, for those of you who are hunters, those would be about number twos. Okay? The other thing that Marion's guys like to do was use buck and ball. That would be a, a, a single musket ball with three buck shots sitting on top of it. Again, a shotgun effect. Okay, but Marion's biggest problem that he generally had was not enough ammunition to do the things you would like to do. Okay? So we will find that later on, after the Bridges campaign, that, that plays a factor as well. This is the Bridges campaign. The Bridges campaign starts about Waibu Swamp, comes through the Mount Hope Swamp, up the Lower Bridge, just, uh, just below King Street, and then all the way over here to Sam Pitt River Bridge, en route to Georgetown. So, what we think, what we think is somewhere around the, the 7th of, correction, the 5th of March, Watson leaves Fort Watson and goes over towards Nelson's Ferry. He goes over to Nelson's Ferry. Now, he is on the north side of the river. He doesn't have to cross the river, so he's on the north side of the Santee. So he is now beginning to make movement, and it does not go unnoticed. Captain Zachary Canny, He's related to the Canneys at Santee. Zachary Canny is actually from over around Camden. He sees these troops, he sees the campfires, and he gets word to Marion that, hey, Watson is on the move. Marion at that time has been camped probably at Quartz Plantation on the south side of the Santee. He gets his men across, 
and he moves over and they figure out that probably you're going to have the uh, have Watson's folks coming through Waibu Swamp. Now Waibu is a wide swamp and it has about a quarter mile causeway. So if you've ever seen a corduroy road where you just cut down logs and you lay them down in the form of a road it gives you some traction so you won't sink in the mud, that's what that corduroy road was. So Marion goes and he puts a position, he uh, is going to meet him there at Waibu Swamp. And it looks something like this. Marion and his men look across the swamp and they see these guys coming. Well, you kind of gave up the element of supply of prize. Okay, but the thing is you gave up the element of surprise, but Watson wasn't going to be surprised to begin with. Some of the locals had told him, hey look, you have to be careful going across Waibu. It's very narrow there. We know that old uh, Wiley Marion, he'll probably have an ambush set up. Well, Marion sees these guys and he falls back. He drops back a few hundred yards and when he does, Watson says, go get them. And when he does that, you have uh, Colonel Henry Richburg with his loyalist mounted uh, the folks that go after Marion. They go tearing across, Marion has pulled his guys back and they're expecting to come up and run into a disorganized group of folks trying to just retreat. Marion set up for him. Richburg halts. Uh-oh, this is not what I thought I was going to see. And then there is Peter Horry with his cavalry charges after them. Okay, now i got to tell you something about Peter Horry. Hey, he is one of the illustrious members of the Marion group. But you've got to remember, folks, these people were just like you and me. With all their foibles and different things, guess what? Peter Horry had a stuttering problem. So if you can imagine, Peter Ory, Richburg stops, and Peter Ory says, okay, cha 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 damn it boys go, you know what I mean. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened according to Tarleton Brown who wrote his memoir some years later. Now, I will tell you, uh, you know, anyone who has served in the military has a, a unique sense of humor. I can only imagine around a campfire later on, somebody looking over at Peter O'Ree and saying, cha 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 <laughs> But anyway, but that happened. So uh, O'Ree's guys charge, and they push them all the way back up to Watson's force, and at that time, they meet something that they had not experienced to this point in the Revolutionary War. Cannon fire. Watson has got those two grasshoppers, and those two grasshoppers fire grape shot. Grape shot's like a big shotgun blast, okay? Ori and his guys turn around and haul tail. They're getting out of Dodge. And as they're, as they're trying to go back, the next thing that happens there is Watson sends the SC Rangers out. Here comes Harrison and his guys. As they come charging forward, they're about to catch the tail end of these folks. And when they do, one horseman spins around. He's a guy named Gavin James. I understand he was a big strapping youth. Well, this big strapping guy, he is now the sole single-handed rear guard for Ori's troops. What happens next is kind of, kind of legend. He uses his musket and he shoots one guy out of the saddle. The next thing he does is he bayonets a second guy. Okay? Trust me, these people are now saying, yeah, this one guy, we got to give him a little bit of respect. And then the next thing that happens, he bayonets a third guy. This guy grabs onto his musket. And as Gavin James goes back to his uh, waiting comrades, he drags this guy with his musket about 50 yards. Okay? Gavin James was a man. Okay, so at that point, the Patriots counterattack again, and you have uh, Conyers and Macaulay. They go forward, but this time you brought up those veteran infantry. Here's another thing that Marion's guys can't stand against bayonets. 64th comes forward with their bayonets, 
Marion, remember, 